So Nick, as the string conductor for OK Computer, what was your impression of the band as musicians in terms of their understanding of music, considering you weren't too familiar with them when you actually met them? What was your impression of them musically? My impression was that Johnny Greenwood was the musical muscle. He was the motor and he was very musical and uh, he knew exactly what he was doing. I frankly didn't clock the other guys, but Tom York, I felt his job was to be the rock and roll guy, you know, to, to, to uh, set things up and to be a bit of a punk and, uh, you know, go against the accepted way of doing things. So I think it was the kind of John Lennon, uh, Paul McCartney, if Johnny Greenman was Paul McCartney, then Tom was the... John Lennon, in the ways John Lennon was the sort of acerbic, edgy guy, you know, and Paul was the sweet guy. It was a, that that was my impression. I don't remember, frankly, the other guys in the band. But to answer your question, Johnny was was the guy. Interesting. And when you were in the when Abbey Road, when you were orchestrating the music, of course, they weren't part of the string section themselves performing. How involved were they with those sessions? Johnny was very hands-on. I mean, he was standing next to me in the studio, next to the conducting podium. What exactly was he doing? Like, why was he present? He'd written the scores. So he, I, I was conducting, and I was on the conductor's podium conducting, and he stood literally at my right hand here, and he had a copy of the score, and he might say could the violas play that bit louder or something? And he might say that to me, that's the etiquette, that the, the, the writer talks through the conductor and the conductor gives the instruction to the, to the orchestra. So that he was heavily involved physically both there and, and in terms of instruction, saying, you know, this, this and this, can you move, can you da, 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 da. The other guys were up in the control room. Tom York, who was there, said to the engineer, this is all too smart. It's all too, you know, shiny and nice and good. Can't you fuck it up a bit? And so uh, the engineer was a bit sort of confused about this. And he said, well, what do you want me to do? And uh, Tom York said, well, why don't you record the whole thing on a dictaphone? You know, the thing that you use for mm -hmm. dictation letters? Um, which would have been horrible. You know, the sound quality would have been absolutely appalling. Um, but I think Tom was just being a rock and roller. He just wanted to, you know, get the mix going and get a bit of rock and roll element into it. Uh, I don't know if the guy recorded it on dictaphone. I'm sure he did. <laughs> but um, anyways, that was that was that, and we got rid of that one. Um, so the other thing I remember is we recorded whatever it was we were intending to record. And then somebody in the group, I can't remember who, said, well, what else can these guys, these guys being the string players, what else do they do? And I said, well, they play the violin or the cello or whatever. He said, well, can they make some odd noises? Okay. Uh, why do you need that? Well, I want to, basically it was a kind of a sampling thing. He wanted to get a whole bunch of freaky effects, sliding noises, you can make harmonics, you can tap the instrument. So we did spend quite a lot of time doing that. I just want to go back to a moment for to Johnny Greenwood. So you were mentioning earlier that he was the, the musical force from your perspective. Yep. He yeah. was with you in the band. Uh, was there anything about him in particular that struck you specifically as like, this guy is the musical guy of the band? Just that he was in charge. Hmm. Uh, in the sense that, uh, I mean, by this stage, obviously, they'd done the tracks, they'd written the songs and so on. So that process had already happened. But for this specific operation, he was the guy. You know? And so, uh, as I said earlier, the other guys took a back seat because this was his baby. You know, And I'm sure if we'd gone back six months before when they were actually writing the songs, that would have been a very different process. But for this particular occasion, uh, he, he, he was the leader. Did you interact at all with uh, Nigel Goodrich, the producer for the record? Only on that session. Uh, I didn't before or after, no. But I, now you've mentioned his name, I do remember him, yeah. Was he, was he as involved as Johnny Greenwood was for that session? 
Oh yeah, sure. Oh yeah, um, very hands on. In fact, I would say he and Johnny were the two drivers of the session, if you like. Um, so yeah, you know, no, a good team. Interesting. So you know, I mean, what I find really interesting about this conversation about Radiohead is it. It seems to me that Johnny Greenwood really, at least in terms of the time you spent with him, was the leader of the band, so to speak. Um, but Tom York is often portrayed as such. They both had their roles, their functions clearly defined, I believe, with Johnny being the, the, the music, music, music guy uh, and Tom York being the front guy, you know, like, like Mick Jagger or, you know, Freddie Mercury or whatever. He's a, So he's perceived as the leader because he's the guy in the front singing the songs mostly in front with the microphone and he's he's in the spotlight literally so i would say there's it, not one or the other that is the leader i think it's they're both co-equal leaders could be in different uh, roles different uh, jobs so how you exactly know? did your relationship with radiohead start how did that all come together okay so i got a call from my agent that a group wanted to record a string section on their tracks and would I liaise with one of the members of the band who had written the scores because he was not confident about what he'd written and would I look at it them and make sure that they were going to work and so Johnny came to my office uh, and showed me the scores that he'd done and they were essentially fine I had made quite a few suggestions and alterations um, and he was very receptive to that, and that was fine. Um, and then he went off, and then a few days later, we did the recording session with the amended scores. And was the recording session a one-day session? I think it was. I think it was a pro pro probably a morning and an afternoon at Abbey Road Studio 2. And so, um, just speaking of the Beatles in Studio 2, is there any particular reason why you guys recorded in Studio 2, or was that just the one that was available? Probably a bit of both. It does have an iconic, absolutely iconic uh, feeling about it. People do want to record there because of the history. Um, I don't know whether that was the case with, with Radiohead. I somehow doubt it because I somehow would feel that they wouldn't want to kind of uh, kowtow to an old... 60s memory you know that that was yesterday and now we're today so i, I doubt if they were beholden to the beatles uh, thing a lot of, as i say a lot of people are uh, absolutely entranced by it and the studio made a very definite uh, decision not to alter it in the slightest way not to repaint it not to change any of the seats the chairs and anything and it's still got, this is an extraordinary thing, it's still got these uh, huge curtains coming down from the side, sort of brown curtains. Um, and they're full of Alaskan seaweed. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now you're going to say why. Yeah, I was going to, uh, what's the deal there? <laughs> because years and years ago, I mean, the studio was built in the 30s, and uh, very early on there was a sort of a crazy engineer designer guy who thought who knows what he was smoking at the time he thought that alaskan seaweed was the thing that would make the sound best and uh, no one's dared he's long dead no one's dared um, you know take that down because my god it what you know if it was taken down and the sound changed who would be responsible for that that's hilarious <laughs> But then maybe other studios should try putting the Alaskan seaweed yes. to see if it, you know what I mean? Are there any, I mean, obviously this was quite a long time ago. This was over 20 years ago. But of the songs you worked on, was there any one that struck you as particularly interesting? Is there any one that you remember the most? I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that. <laughs> uh, part, part of the problem is it's a long time ago. Part of the problem is, and this happened a lot in the pop world at that time, is the songs didn't have titles. Hmm. It was just called song one or, or you know track eight or something. So uh, you never quite know what tracks you're dealing with because it, they would be titled after the event. So I can't really give you an answer to that. I mean, if you play me something, I'd probably go, oh yes, that one, you know. But um, 
time time has eroded the, the memory of that one. No problem at all. Do you recall your personal reaction to when you first heard the record itself when it was completed? I thought that it was great. It was groundbreaking in many ways. I do remember thinking they've used the strings well and that they've mixed them high in the mix. <clears throat> A lot of guys in the pop business push the strings way, way back or even out altogether. But Presumably because of Johnny's influence, uh, the strings were quite high profile in the mix. So, yeah, I enjoyed it. So, you know, in terms of uh, the Beatles, you've worked with Paul McCartney. And you mentioned a little bit earlier that you would compare Johnny Greenwood to Paul McCartney of the Radiohead. Knowing both of them personally, do they have similar musical approaches or personalities? I did, you know, I only met Johnny Greenwood maybe four or five times. Like, I couldn't really give a, a, a concept uh, to him. I mean, he, I, he was very musical. Uh, so that is certainly a common thread between them. McCartney is McCartney, you know. <laughs> he is what he is, huge, huge, huge talent. Um, I, I don't think there's a comparison there. I mean, McCartney has always been the ultimate melody man. You know, he, that's in his soul writing, if you like, almost old-fashioned diatonic melodies, sort of influenced by his father and so on. Uh, um, I, I don't hear that in, in Johnny's work. I hear a much more rock, punk vibe, hmm. not so much, you know, uh, if you like, old-fashioned melodies. So, no, I don't think there's a huge link between them other than both being very talented. So, yeah. I'm just curious about the, I guess from your perspective, from like the technical end of it, when you're preparing either for specifically for the Radiohead session or in general, what is the, like, this, the preparation you have to do to get ready to, to conduct the orchestra? If it was Oasis, they'd just say, see you in the pub. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> what was your experience like working with Oasis, if I may ask? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Where to start? Um, I don't, want, I don't want to end up in jail. <laughs> <laughs> That's very um, funny. <laughs> so I can only say it was um, an experience. And uh, yeah, that's probably where I should leave it. That's very funny. <laughs> we'll leave it right there. Yeah. That's, that's very cool. <laughs> Tom York, from the experience you had with him, what was he like personality-wise? Well, remember, this was really a short time I was with them, you know, a day, if that. Um but he was provocative. Uh, he was um, very bright, very intelligent, clearly educated. Uh, but as I said earlier, he was, you know, it's a bit back to Oasis for a minute. Noel Gallagher was the musical muscle, but Liam was the crazy one. I'm not saying Tom York was crazy, but Liam was the stirrer, the rock and roll guy, you know? And I think that's that similarity with Tom York is he was the provoker. He liked to provoke. And that's fine. And it worked. You know, Johnny Greenwood was quite a quiet guy, quite studious, uh, um, but obviously hugely talented. Interesting. So how would you compare um, Oasis to Radiohead in terms of their, like, as artists? Oh gosh, so different. So I, I, <laughs> there's a book to be written about that. <laughs> really, it, maybe it, you should write it. That'd be um, cool. In, in what regard? Well, Oasis were a rock and roll band, pure and simple. Um, hugely influenced by the Beatles, but they were a loud, raucous bunch of guys from Manchester. Uh, with a rough background, with a sort of, um, if you know, sort of almost thug mentality. They wanted to, they wanted to knock your door down, you know. Um, Radiohead were cultured and educated and clever. So I think it's really two very different, very different bands, very different. Hmm. Just as a personal preference, who's, I mean, this might be a dangerous question, but whose music do you personally <laughs> prefer? 
Uh, that's oh gosh. I think that it's, it's short and cheese. They're so different. Mm-hmm. So different. You know, if you're in a if you're late night in the pub and you want to, you know, have a fight, then put Oasis on. <laughs> if you want to and smoke a joint, then you put OK Computer on. You know. Is there any one memory or thought you have of Radiohead that sticks out to you from the time you spent with them? I think Johnny, uh, uh, Tom York's Let's Make This Sound Really Terrible st- sticks in my mind. And that telling the engineer that he wanted to record it on a dictaphone, uh, that <laughs> sticks in my mind. That's funny. Because it's, it's, the, it's a complete reverse of what you do in a studio. 100%. <laughs> which is, you know, you, you've got microphones in the studio, uh, 10,000 pounds microphones, literally. Uh, they're, they're very special in Abbey Road. Uh, and, you know, the acoustics and the best string players in the world and blah, blah, blah. And he wants to make it sound like a, a bad karaoke. Do you know if he was dead serious about that or was it maybe a sarcastic back no, I think No, I think not. I think he was just doing his Liam Callagher <laughs> you know, you mentioned that during the string sessions for that for that record, as was typical, the songs were entitled. There were no vocals, so you were just perform. You were just orchestrating the strings. Um, do you recall? You know, obviously you wouldn't know the exact song because there was no titles. But was there any point when you were doing this that you actually were enjoying the music and thought this was good music? Yes. And oh yes. All the time, yeah. I mean, I've had to work with some terrible rubbish over the years. Um, But this clearly was very good. So, yes, I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed, uh, if you like, in a sort of slightly father style, because I was a lot older than Johnny, like a sort of mentor, you know, I was enjoying guiding him. Do you remember that initial meeting with Johnny Greenwood? Like, was he nervous to meet you or anything along those lines? Like, What was he like? Uh, he was, as I said before, very quiet, studious, a bit shy, and I think he was nervous that his stuff, I, I would have, of course I didn't, but I might have said, this is the biggest load of rubbish, go away, take up another job. Like when you gave your homework to the teacher. You know? yeah. um, yeah. It was that kind of relationship, but of course it was fine what he'd done. Do you know why Radiohead sought you in particular to work with them? I had a track record as the guy, the go-to guy for strings on pop records. I knew about them, but I didn't know who they were really because it was kind of early days and I I hadn't been in that particular area of of music for a while. So um, I just thought nothing of it. And then I'm told it's a very important record. And um, so I'm glad to be part of it, even though they spelt my name wrong. Really? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that's unfortunate. Nick, yeah. I think it's Nick Ingham with an H. My name is I N G M A N. But I'm so used to it being misspelled that you know what the hell. <laughs> what did you think of the sound of that record sonically? Do you think did you what did you think of the production quality of it? Very very high. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good. Obviously very carefully done. But without being facile, without being too sparkly too clean it still had an element of punk or or element of roughness which was presumably their idea no high quality 